Well, good morning. How are you guys doing today? That was uh, as one of my famous terms. That was pretty dope uh, in worship. And uh, I love it, love it, love it, love it. Absolutely. I'm so glad you guys are here. Uh, Easter with us. Um, uh, I think it's going to be a special morning for us. And so um, especially if you're a guest, man, just want to say welcome from uh, my heart to yours. I'm so glad you're with us today. And I want to start with uh, this idea. It's kind of a popular story. Uh, it's been told for years, even though we don't know uh, its origin. And it kind of goes this way. There was a famous type roper uh, guy who would go all across Europe, and uh, he would kind of, uh, you know, was known for his aerial feats. Um, he would uh, kind of type rope across skyscrapers. He would, he would just, any two high places, he would type rope from one end to the other, and he was known as a guy who's kind of this daredevil of a guy who would type rope. Uh, as he was going, he wanted to make his act appear more dangerous, and so he would do things like um, put on a blindfold and then type rope. Uh, or put on a blindfold type rope with a wheelbarrow across. Uh, it is said that an American um, uh, uh, kind of um, promoter came and approached him and said, would you be willing to do some of those European feats over in America? And would you come with us over to, uh, to this side of the, the, the hemisphere and see if you can do it over here? I have this idea. Why don't you tightrope rope across Niagara Falls? The guy is uh, plenty excited about the challenge. He says, absolutely, I would love to do that. And so after they debate his fee and whatnot and how they would promote the event, they decided that he would start on one side of Niagara Falls, the Canadian side, and he would tightrope over to the American side of Niagara Falls. And so he gets on there, he, he goes across, uh, uh, and, and sure, there's a crowd watching, and then he says, how many of you guys think I can do this with a blindfold? The crowd goes crazy. And so he goes back and he does it with a blindfold. Now, how many guys think I can do this with a blindfold and a wheelbarrow and go across? The crowd goes crazy. And so he goes across with a blindfold and a wheelbarrow across the most treacherous part of Niagara Falls. And then finally he comes back and says, how many of you guys think I can do this with a blindfold and a wheelbarrow with a person inside the wheelbarrow? And everybody goes, yes, I want to see that. I was like, yes, I want to see somebody die. I mean, I want to see you make it. And so, and, and the crowd goes crazy. Yes, we think you can do it. He goes, great. Who's going to jump in the wheelbarrow? And the crowd goes silent. They didn't get to see that one that day. And you can imagine why. I mean, all of us understand that there are some things out there that I might make myself available to watch and then there's other things that I would make myself available to do. Uh, there's some things that I'll make myself available to watch from far away. And there's some things that I make, my, make myself available to participate in. Some of those things are very clear to me. I love going, one of my favorite places going in L.A. is going to Santa Monica. I love the street pan handlers on, on a Santa Monica Pier or 3rd Street uh, on Friday nights or whatever. I love seeing those guys. And, hey, I'll watch them all day long. But if you start juggling, you know, torches of fire, I'm not juggling torches of fire. If you start juggling like three-foot machetes, that's cool for you, but I ain't doing that. I mean, it's just very clear to me some things I'm willing to watch and some things I'm willing to do. Uh, another one, people fly from all over the world to South Africa so they can swim with great white sharks. I ain't doing that. Uh, you can, in fact, I'll watch it on TV and kind of hope that the great white bites your leg off, but I ain't doing it myself. I, I'm not going to do that one. You know what I'm saying? Some things I'm willing to watch, some things I will not do. I remember I was watching The Amazing Race several years ago, and there was this team, and they were in some kind of third world country, and they had to eat a food to get to the next part of their race. They had to eat this food. And so out comes these plates with a live baby octopus, like flopping on the plate. And they have to eat the baby octopus. And I'm thinking, I can't wait to watch you eat it, but I'm not eating a baby. I mean, I would never eat a live baby octopus. I think of things like, like let's say, sucking out the venom of a rattlesnake. You know what I mean? I've always said, if you are on a hike with me and you get bit by a rattlesnake, I'm sorry, but you're going to die. <laughs> like, you are going to die. You need to pray to Jesus because you're about to see him because I'm not sucking the venom out of, out of your leg or your big fat toe. Not going to happen. Hopefully somebody comes by with a vacuum cleaner or something, but I am not sucking out the venom. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Some things I'm willing to watch and some things I'm not willing to do. Today we're going to look at an interaction between Jesus and a young man, and this is actually going to be the topic at hand. Uh, can Christianity be considered a spectator sport? We're going to look at that today. At what point in my faith journey must I go from being the consumer 
to being the participant? At what point in my faith journey do I stop being the consumer and start becoming the participant? When does someone transition from being in the audience to jumping in the barrel as it relates to their faith? And for that, we're going to be in the book of Luke. I need you to turn there right now. If you have a Bible with you, turn to chapter, uh, chapter 18 of the book of Luke. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, it's okay. We have the, the, the passages will be on the screen for you. But if you have a phone and you've downloaded the version, please go there with us. Go there with us. Highlight. Put notes in there. And uh, make sure that what we're saying comes straight from the word of God. Luke chapter 18 is where we're going. One of the four gospel narratives that describes Jesus' life. We're going to look at a particular story in there from Luke chapter 18, starting at verse 18. And really we're asking the question, or looking at the idea today, good versus God. That's what we tell the message, good versus God. Look at Luke chapter 18 and verse 18. It says this, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Great question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and your mother. All these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. And Jesus heard this and he said to him, you still lack one thing, sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the man heard this, he, he went away very sad because he was a man of great wealth. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard this asked, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus replied, what is impossible with men is possible with God. So you have this interaction. Jesus is on the scene. He's doing his ministry. This young man hears of Jesus, and he runs to him, and he has this interaction. He has a great question. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what I've done is I've just taken this story, and I've broken it up into four different movements, because it seems like there's four different movements in the story. And the first movement is the question. The question, and I'm not really referring to the question that he asked Jesus. I'm referring to the question that Jesus asked him back. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except for God alone. So we we know from this story, because it's written in other gospels, this is not the only gospel the story is written, we know from other other kind of uh, perspectives of the same story, we know this guy is young. We know he's rich. Uh, we know he's some kind of official, some kind of a leader, whether he's a leader in the synagogue or, or he's a leader, lead, leader in, in a secular society, maybe he's an official of the city, a mayor type thing, something like that. But whatever he is, he's gotten there fast. He's young, he's, he's gotten there fast, he's rich, he's got, he's got notoriety, he's got fame, he's got money, he's got authority, he's got power. He's got all these things, and this is the man that runs to Jesus, and according to another gospel, jumps on his knees and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What a question. What a question that he would ask. And it's rather interesting. I wonder what, how you would respond if somebody asked you that question. Well, how would you respond if somebody ran to you and said, hey, how do I get to heaven? That's what he was saying. How do I get there? What would you say? Maybe if you've been in the faith any kind of period of time, any length of time, you might say, oh, i got to take you to Romans 3, 23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God's way up here, and by virtue of being a human being, you're down here. Just by virtue of being human, you don't deserve him. you got to understand that every human falls short of the glory of God. God's up here. He is light. He cannot be in the same room as darkness. And we represent, unfortunately, by virtue of being human, we represent darkness. And so we, we are far apart, and, and you wouldn't leave the person there. Maybe you'd go to Romans 6, 23 afterwards, and you would say, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The wages of sin is death. You know, what, what has sin brought you? What is, what is doing the activity opposite of God brought you? It brings forth death. That's the consequence of sin. All the way back in Genesis, the, the very first chapters of the Bible, that there's a consequence for doing wrong, wrong, wrongdoing, and it is death. But there's this gift of God. Then maybe you would take them to, to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. 
For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works that no one should boast. That there's a way that you can have communion with God, that you can be in relationship with God, even though we have this devastating kind of, uh, of, of separation, you can be in communion with God when you believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That what we celebrate on Easter is that Jesus Christ came to earth, lived the life that we could never live, and died our death for us. And that that God would place all of my wrongdoings, past, present, and future, on Jesus Christ and give me credit for the life I could never live, a perfect life, so that when God looks at me, he goes, I can see you through the force field of the blood of Jesus Christ, so to speak, and you're perfect, and that's why I can allow you into heaven. Maybe you would go through all that if somebody asked you that question. But isn't it interesting? And that's why we celebrate Easter, right? He's risen, he rose again. He's the first fruit of the life that we're gonna get one day. What happened to him is gonna happen to me. That, that, That death no longer has a sting, he's taking care of it. I get to be with God in heaven forever. That's what maybe you would say. But isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't do that? Jesus does none of that. He doesn't do that. In fact, he kind of ignores the question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he goes, why do you call me good? He he ignores the question completely. Why do you even call me good? There's only one who is good. His name is God. Isn't it interesting that he does that? He goes in, you, you, you come to me and you approach me with this title of good. What does that mean to you? What does it mean to you that I'm good? Like, what does that title mean? Are you, are, there's only one being who could truly embody that title of goodness, it would be God. He's the only righteous one. Are you ready to call me God? Are you ready to admit that I have divinity? Or are you just kind of using it as empty flattery? And so Jesus does this unexpected thing here where he doesn't hurry up and lead the guy through a prayer like I think maybe we've been trained to do or maybe we'd feel compelled to do in that situation. He doesn't do it. No, he asks them, a weird question, and then he goes through a list with them. And so number two is the list. The list. Second movement of the story is the list. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your mother and father. And the guy says, oh, yeah, I know all those. I know the Ten Commandments. I've been doing all those since I was a little boy. Most Americans uh, would say that if you ask them, what is the barometer of God? What is the, 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 how do you measure goodness? What are God's standards? If you were to ask that question, I think it's like 80% of Americans say, oh, the Ten Commandments. They may not be able to quote any of them, but they know that the Ten Commandments is like what you should follow. And Jesus just goes through them. Hey, you're a good Jewish kid. You know the law of the Old Testament. Don't, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't give false testimony. Honor your mother and father. Oh, I've been doing all those since I was a little boy. It's really interesting that he would say that because the Bible in the New Testament seems to indicate that it's impossible to actually fulfill the Ten Commandments. I'll just read you a short passage. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight, that's in God's sight, by observing the law. Rather, the law become, by, through the law we become conscious of sin. The, 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 the reason that the law is there, the Ten Commandments is there, is to let us know that we don't measure up to God. It's impossible to measure up to God. That's why they're there. That's why they're written. So we go, oh man, I need help. I can't make this on my own. I can't make it on my own. If you could live up to the Ten Commandments, okay, then you would be worthy of God, but it's impossible to live up to those Ten Commandments. So if it's impossible to live up to the Ten Commandments, if it's impossible, why did you bring it up, Jesus? Why did you bring it up to this man? He's trying to bring the man to a greater understanding that he's in great spiritual need. Great spiritual need. This is not going to be a situation where you run over here, hey, look at me. I mean, I, I've got everything figured out on this earth. I got a good job. I'm young. I've got authority. I got prestige. I got fame. Hey, listen, and I like what you're talking about, Jesus, so I'm going to happily let you have me. You can have me. I'm going to join your team. Don't you want me on your team? And Jesus is like, oh, no, no, it's not going to be one of those situations where I need you. 
This is going to be one of those situations where you need me. You're going to say, no, no, oh my God, I need God. God doesn't need me. I need him. And that's what he's trying to do. God's not lucky to have you. You're lucky to have God. And to further drive this point home, he decides to show the man that he hasn't kept the commandments after all. In fact, he's going to break one of them right in his midst. And so we see the test. Number three, the third movement, the test. Here we have the test. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And when he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. And we've got to stop here for a moment and kind of talk about this. This part or this section of scripture or this story has been misunderstood by many, many different people. I remember being in college um, 20 years ago. Uh, I would go to a private university, and then in the summers I would go to a junior college or something of that nature and get as many units done as possible because they were a lot cheaper there and they were quite easier too. And so I would go there, get, you know, and then transfer those units into my, to my private university so I could save money was the idea. And I'd end up taking this philosophy class. And I had a philosophy professor who said, so obviously, if you look at this story, you cannot look at this story and not understand that God has a prejudice against rich people. That was how he interpreted it. That so obviously God has a, has a prejudice against rich people, which if God has a prejudice against rich people, he has a prejudice against every American in the United States because by worldly standards, we're all rich. And so he said, obviously God doesn't like rich people. You must commit yourself to a vow of poverty to follow God. That's how he understood it because the rich man was to sell everything he had to inherit the kingdom of God. I think that's an over-literal translation. And believe it or not, there's a, there's a time where you can be over-literal on a translation. You can actually say something it's not meaning to say because you're, you're taking it too literally. Jesus was just proving to the guy that he had not followed the Ten Commandments as, thought, as, as he thought. And I'll tell you why. Because the first commandment says, you shall have no other God besides me. The very first one, you shall have no other God besides me. And Jesus looks into the guy's heart and goes, oh, I can see what the problem is. Your God, your little G God, your idol is your money. And so for you, you're going to have to get rid of that idol if you're going to follow me. That's all he's trying to do. And so he tests them. He says, do you love me more than you love your money? You could say the same thing about sex. Do you love God more than you love sex? You can say the same, same thing about power and authority and control. Do you love God more than you love being in control? Do you love God more than you love being in authority? Do you love God more than you love being in power? You could say it of fame and esteem and reputation. You could say it of drugs and alcohol. Uh, what little G God do you have out there where here is God and this, this, this thing is kind of encroached on your concept of God and it's become more important to you than God himself. It's become a little G God to you and you've had another God before me. And so he tests them. If there's anything on this earth that we would hold in higher regard than God, then it is your God. And he tests the guy. Don't lose don't lose the point in the specific context. It was his God he was talking to, money. But the principle is the same. If you want to attach yourself to me, rich young ruler, you're going to have to detach yourself from everything else in this world. If you want to attach yourself to me, you're going to have to detach yourself from anything that this world offers you. It doesn't mean that you can't have things. It just means on the importance meter, I'm more important to you than any of those things. The test was a living illustration of the man that he had another God besides God. And therefore, he did not keep the Ten Commandments as he had thought. And in fact, he did need Jesus, and Jesus did not need him. And instead of acknowledging this and turning towards Jesus, he chose to keep his God of money. And the reaction of his disciples are rather interesting. The, the fourth part of, of the story is the miracle. Let's look at it, verse 24. Jesus looked at him and he said, how hard is it for, 
for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That's really interesting. You seen a camel? You see how big those things are? You ever got a needle that you, that you do sewing with? How possible is it for a camel to go through the eye of a needle? It is quite impossible. It is completely absurd to even think of its possibility. And he's saying it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard this said, man, if that's a standard, then who can be saved? And Jesus makes this profound statement, what is impossible with men is possible with God. What is he saying? He makes mention that it's especially hard for those who are accustomed to self-dependence to bring themselves to a place of God-dependence. I've been so used to being independent and being self-dependent, dependent upon myself, that I'm not sure how easy it is for me to go, man, I really need God on this one. That's all he's saying. It's, e- it's harder for them because they've been so self-dependent all this time. How do I get God-dependent? And the disciples are like, man, that, the bar is that high. Then who's going to be saved? And Jesus says, oh, you don't understand. Salvation is a, is a work of God. What is impossible for men is very possible with God. God is the author of salvation. He's the one who can break any bondage you have to any little G God in your life. He can do it. And so we see a story of a man with the right question, but the wrong response to the answer. He had the right question, but he had the wrong response to the answer. And really, if we're going to boil down this whole story to one point that Jesus is trying to make, what would it be? It's our big idea of the day, and we're going to spend some time here. What does God want you to consider this Easter? What would God want you to consider this Easter? This Easter season, what does God have for you in your consideration process? And I think the answer would be this. Is Jesus good or is he God in your life? Is he good or is he God? You see, the the, the young man came running. Hey, I know you're a good teacher. Hey, man, I know you're good. I've got everything figured out in this world, man. I got all the money, I got the fame, I got the authority. I got everything figured out. Now I'm trying to get the next life figured out too. What do I need to do? Just tell me what I need to do so I can have the next life figured out as much as I got this life figured out. I, I know you're good, and Jesus goes, oh, you call me good, but will you call me God? Am I God in your life? Are you ready to rank yourself under me and say I'm God in your, in your life? You're ready to put every other God, little G God, away and put him aside. So, no, no, you're the one true big G God. All these other things are pale in comparison to you. You are number one priority. You're not merely good. You are God. You're not merely in the background. You're in the forefront. Is he good or is he God? Is he in the background or is he in the forefront? Is he the first priority or is he in the top ten? Is he, is he the person that you consult prior to every important decision? Or is he simply made aware of it afterwards like everyone else? Is he good or is he God? Does he complete the perfect picture for you of what a life should look like? Or is he life itself? Is he good or is he God? Is he good or is he God? You see, it's one thing to sit back and watch. And it's clearly another thing to get in the wheelbarrow yourself and participate. And maybe what God has for you this Easter season is the question, am I good or am I God? Am I the wallpaper in the background? Or am I in the center of everything? Where is he to you? Is he good or is he God? When you get in the real bell, you're saying, I'm all in. There's nothing else here. This is what I got. I got you. I claim you above everything else. I claim you more than I claim my 403B, my 401K. I claim you more than I claim the property I own. I claim you more than any of the material things in my life. I claim you more than everything. All that stuff pales in comparison to who you are. You are God. Is he good? Or is he God? And unfortunately, this young man runs to Jesus, and he has the right position. He jumps on his knees. 
And he says, you're a good teacher. I know if there's anybody out here who can lead me to how to get close to God and, and to lead me in the direction of God, it's you. And Jesus says, are you ready to call me God? And he goes, yeah, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Have you lived this life? Yeah, I've lived a perfect life. No, you haven't. You have another God beside him. And once he comes to face to face with that, an acknowledgement of that, instead of saying, you're right, you're right, there's another God beside you, and I need to, I need to put that God aside and value you as God. Instead of doing that, he walks away. He says, no, no, no. If that's the call, if that's the call, then it's too much for me. And I can't do it. I can't do it. We're going to have the band come up, and we're going to sing a song together. It's a beautiful song. In fact, you guys can come up right now and get ready. Beautiful song. It says, come to the altar. Come to the altar. He won't reject you. Based on the blood of Christ, he won't reject you. Beautiful, beautiful song. And I'm hoping, and this is the, the weird side of this pastor. I don't know how to describe it to you. The weird, this, the, the, the side says, I want, God, I want you to do something, something that lasts, something that's just more than just, man, we had a good song service, and, man, we had a cool video. Like, do something that, like, lasts forever, that, that, that starts in the temporal and, and, and keeps on going through eternity. Like, do something in our room. And I was praying, Lord, be with us. Be in the room with us. Let the Spirit of God move back and forth that you would illuminate this story into somebody's heart and mind. They go, I've got to do something about this. I cannot sit here any longer. I've got to show that he's more than good to me. He's God. I've got to do it. And so we're going to sing this song. It says, come to the altar. And if you're in the room and you're saying, that's me. I, I, I know I cannot leave without doing something. We're going to give you a chance. We're not just going to sing the song. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. This is going to be our altar today. This is going to be our stage we're going to dim the lights down, and it's going to be you and God. You and God. And you're going to get a chance to respond to this and say, God, you're more than good to me. You're more than good to me. You're God. You're God. And I want to show you. And so you're going to have an opportunity to come forward. You, dim lights, and God. Nobody will be watching you. If there's any authority that I have as a lead pastor of this church, don't stare at anybody. You let them do their business with God. And you come forward and you're going to have an opportunity to respond to God. You think, this guy's crazy. Yeah, I am. I am crazy. I just believe that God wants to do business with you in your life. And if that is true of your heart, then you will take an action forward. Instead of like the man who runs and turns around, I want you to run towards him. You run towards him. So we're going to sing this song. Then I'm going to come back up here in the middle of that song, and I'm going to give you some instructions. Right now what I'm going to do is going to pray that God will give you the courage to do exactly what you know you need to do. And that you wouldn't leave here without responding to the message of God. Let's pray. Father, we know you're everywhere. You're omnipresent. You're as present here this morning as you are in China, in Russia, in, this, in, in the South America, any continent on this earth. You can hear millions of prayers at the same time. You're, omni you're everywhere, God. There's nowhere you're not. And yet we know from Scripture there's, there's a sense where we can invite you. And there's a sense where you want to be invited. And we say, you're welcome here. You move in our midst. Show us your presence. Show us through the reaction of your word. You say your word will never return void through the molding of hearts, that something would happen of eternal value right here, right now, this morning. Then in the months to come, we would see people get baptized. And that's when God got a hold of me. It was like God was speaking to me in the very room. That's what I want, Lord. That's what I'm asking for. It's bold. It's crazy. It's only you can do it. And yet I ask for it because only you can do it. And so I say, Father, would you embolden people as they know they've got to, they got to leave some gods on the altar today. You know what? This has been my God. i got to leave it today. I can't take it with me. I gotta leave it today because I gotta make sure God is more than good. I gotta make sure he's God. I don't want you to be just good. I want you to be God in my life. And I pray you embolden them. Give them courage. And as we sing this song and I come back up, give them the courage to do exactly what they know they need to do. I ask you to do it. The evidence will be what you did in our midst. I pray you do it. In Jesus' name, amen.